priest. Then I saw it. Just a matter of time before the slate from the roof was ripped loose and flying through the air. I could hear everything from inside. Our house began to twist around from side to side. I said the only thing to do now is to pray. It's September 1938. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt struggles to pull America out of the Depression. Congress has recently enacted the first national minimum wage, 25 cents an hour. World attention is focused on Nazi Germany's growing domination of Europe. Many people believe war is inevitable. And on the morning of the 16th, the residents of New England's coastal communities are in the last days of a rainy summer. It had been a strange summer in terms of the weather. Uh, unusual heat at various periods throughout the summer, heavy rainfall that created widespread flooding, particularly in the Connecticut River Valley Basin, so all through Connecticut into western Massachusetts. In Jamestown, Rhode Island, Norm Caswell fires up his school bus for the morning run into town. As usual, he crosses a one-lane causeway flanked on both sides by Narragansett Bay. The road is built on a sandbar, making it susceptible to flooding during the rainy summer. It's the only way for Caswell to pick up the kids on his route. His passengers are a microcosm of the community. The sons of a Greek fisherman, the children of the town lighthouse keeper, and three daughters and one son of Portuguese farmer Joseph Matos. Good morning, Mr. Caswell. Good morning, Teresa. Hey, Joe. Good morning, Teresa. Over the years, Caswell has watched the children grow up. He was very uh, friendly with the kids and protective. So you get very attached to the kids and you know their families and you know you, you go that extra mile. 70 miles away in Fenwick, Connecticut, actress Katherine Hepburn is nursing a troubled career and a failing romance. At her family's waterfront home, she distracts herself with books, golf, and swimming. For Katherine Hepburn, it was the most magical place on earth. It was a place where you could run wild, physically and imaginatively. It was summer camp every day of the year. It seems like a pleasant end to a wet season. But 4,000 miles away, a tempest is brewing in the Atlantic near the Cape Verde Islands off the coast of Africa. The islands are the birthplace of many tropical storms. They mark the edge of a huge, deep pool of warm water, and heat is the fuel that can transform a tropical storm into a deadly hurricane. Cape Verde hurricanes are purely tropical. Their processes in both formation and intensification are purely tropical, which means that they have the potential to be most efficient at turning the energy from the ocean surface into wind energy and uh, therefore produce the strongest hurricanes. During the first week of September, just such a storm is spawned. It starts as a cluster of thunderstorms. As it crosses these warm waters, it sucks up more and more energy. By the 14th, its winds reach 74 miles an hour, officially making it a hurricane. On the morning of September 16th, Weather Bureau Director Grady Norton and his assistant Gordon Dunn arrive at their offices in Jacksonville, Florida. Yeah, I was thinking about it. About time. Not too busy. Many consider Norton one of the best forecasters in the country. 
The 23-year veteran of the Bureau often relies on his gut feelings over analytical methods. On the other hand, Gordon Dunn has a much more methodical approach to weather prediction. He is a rising star in the field of meteorology. Probably often they didn't agree, but certainly together those strengths made for a very, very effective hurricane forecast team. Three years earlier, both Norton and Dunn had witnessed the calamitous Labor Day hurricane of 1935 that devastated the Florida Keys. They had warned people of the approaching storm, but had vastly underestimated its intensity. It killed more than 400 people. It made Norton and Dunn that much more determined to make sure that that was not going to happen again in that er their area, and it was not going to happen on their watch. This day, their attention is focused on reports of the powerful new storm spawned near the Cape Verde Islands. But their information is limited. I think we need to keep an eye on this one. Their key tool is the barometer coupled with close observation of wind and waves. The Weather Bureau, as of 1938, was still essentially using equipment that had existed almost for centuries. It wouldn't be until the next generation that the Weather Bureau really developed the modern equipment of meteorology, such things as radar, the use of jet planes. Most observational data still come from the thousands of military and commercial ships at sea but delivery of information is slow. It took hours for reports to make it to an office where they could physically hand plot the map and then do their own analyses. So it was sort of like running in slow motion. What speed? Don't On September 16th, Grady Norton picks up a ship to shore message that describes pounding seas northeast of Puerto Rico. Made its way almost unseen and if it weren't for ship reports at that time, we likely would have had a hard time assessing that there even was a, a hurricane of that magnitude sitting out there. Norton and Dunn fear a replay of the tragic 1935 hurricane. A tropical disturbance of dangerous proportions is gathering in the Caribbean. Traveling at 20 the next morning, Norton broadcasts a storm warning for Miami and the rest of the state. Tuesday morning. Every the people in Florida knew what hurricanes were, knew what to expect. The Red Cross was available. There were reserves of telephone workers and reserves of uh, cleanup workers ready to go. On the evening of Monday, September 19th, the forecasters received some welcome news. The storm will miss Florida and turn north, pushed by a convergence of fronts moving up the east coast. By the following morning, the two forecasters have spent nearly 100 straight hours tracking the storm. At 9.30 a.m., Grady Norton issues an alert. All vessels from the Virginia Capes to Charleston, South Carolina, should stay in harbor. I repeat, all vessels in path at all... But this warning comes at a price. The ships at sea, they were the information gatherers. So when they were called into port, you lost your source of information there to make forecast and to make intelligent reports. The storm is moving to the north. Looks like we miss our coast entirely. Norton and Dunn expect that the hurricane will die as it heads north and hits the cool waters off the northeast coast. Eleven hundred miles north, Norm Caswell delivers his busload of children safely home. Catherine Hepburn relaxes at the summer retreat she has known for 25 years. But these familiar shores will soon become unrecognizable. 